Thumbs up when you want me to do it. Good evening, everyone. Oh, this one works really well. Good evening, everyone. A particular welcome to all of you who are joining us this evening via live stream. We're just going to get more, um, started in a few moments, allowing everyone to kind of find a seat and settle themselves. So keep talking. I just wanted to kind of introduce and, and welcome everyone who's joining us online tonight. Hi, Steve. How are you? Good to go How are you? Nice to see you. You're back from uh, Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. How was it? Good trip. So, so what is it? No, it's So I think we're about ready. Uh, are we okay, Chris? All right, so uh, let me welcome you all here uh, in the fifth week of Lent. And uh, because of that and how close we are in approaching the center of our faith in Easter, and because of the topic we have to discuss tonight, I think we could use prayer. So let us pray. Good and gracious God, the source of every gift we treasure in life, there is no more precious good than life itself. And so we come to you tonight to think about the world in which we live, in which life is so sacred and at times so dishonored in so many ways. To create a better world, need the, we need the best of our reason and intelligence. But even the very best of that is still in need of your help. And so we ask you to guide the way we think and speak and act in the face of human life, especially when the issue is war and peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So uh, this lecture arises out of last Lent. We do things in the church in repetition. I gave a lecture on the pontificate of Francis last year during Lent. And so in talking to Kelly about Lent this year, I said I would do another lecture and hadn't decided on the theme yet. Uh, but it's a theme uh, that I've talked for a long time, thought about a long time, and unfortunately is all too present with us, the theme of war and peace. Now at the same time after I decided to do this, I began to think of another fact, and that is this very complicated situation of the Ukraine. We have here in this parish one of the most uh, well-known, nationally uh, famous authors on this question. Dr. Tim Colson, uh, who, uh, whose wife unfortunately died within the past year. She was a lector for us, 
And Tim has written and, uh, extensively on this question. So that sobered me up a little bit more, knowing he was there. And I remembered a very famous anecdote that's used in academic life often. And that is, there was a man who had survived the Johnstown flood. And he went to heaven and he said to St. Peter, I want to tell everybody here what it was like to survive the Georgetown, Johnstown flood. And Peter said, well, I don't think you, they're going to be very interested in that. And so the man was persistent day after day. And so finally, St. Peter said, okay, I'll give you one hour to talk about the Johnstown flood. But I want you to remember one thing. In the third row in front of you, looking you right in the eye, is Noah. <laughs> You're going to make the Georgetown flood interesting. Understand that Noah's there. So, I haven't talked to Tim Colton, but uh, I want to profess to you the difference between his skill set on this question and mine. So I am really going to talk about three things tonight. Uh, each one of them uh, could be a lecture in itself, but we don't have time for three lectures. So. I want to speak first about the context wider than Ukraine. And it is what many people today are calling the return of great power politics to our world. Uh, I want to say something about that because to some degree the war in Ukraine is an example of great power politics at work. And I also want to say something about it because the consequences of Ukraine uh, are far reaching beyond the situation in itself and indeed have uh, reshaped to some degree the way we think about world politics generally. Now today people talk about the return of great power politics. Well, it's a return from where? the 20th century, we lived through three wars, two world wars and the Cold War. And the first world war was the result of great power politics in another age. It was the way the world was thought about, which we inherited from the 19th century and entered the 20th century with. And basically the world at that time in political terms was centered in Europe and there were five great powers. The United Kingdom, Russia, France, Germany, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Those were the dominant powers. They were also the dominant colonial powers in the world. And in a sense, from the 1870 on, uh, those powers were determinative of world politics. But it was also the case that those five powers, uh, by enormous misjudgments on many grounds, uh, led to World War I, a war that was never expected, a war that kills 10 to 15 million people a war that people entered thinking it would be over by Christmas when it began in August and it ground on for four years. Great power politics led to the First World War. Between the First and Second World Wars, great power politics didn't really function. But what filled the void were three great ideologies. Nazism, Fascism, and Communism. And then coming out of that period, you come to World War II and its consequences. 50 million people dead. And the legacy of nuclear weapons as a lasting reality after that war. What took its place was a special version of great power politics not the five similar kind of states, but two states that were called superpowers, not just great powers. 
because they were the only two that could operate on a global scale across the world and the only two that had the capacity to what you might call calling the moment of truth. That is to say, reaching for nuclear weapons. So from 1945 until 1990, the world lived in this condition. The two great powers had the capacity to threaten human existence. Not just that, this country or that country, but to threaten human existence. And there was a huge gap between those two and everyone else. So the model of five similar powers balancing each other was not there. This stark contrast was there. What kept the peace is still an open question. But for many, one of the things that kept the peace is what threatened the peace. And that were nuclear weapons and how they were understood in what's called the doctrine of deterrence, which essentially says that if anyone uses this weapon, there will be a response and there will be no survivors. And some people call that the crystal ball effect, that whereas in World War I, these five major powers entered a war in a sense with no understanding of the depth of what was ahead of them. The crystal ball effect made it very clear to anyone that the consequence of using these weapons was certain and sure. And so the argument was that that was our greatest threat and the second argument was that that might have been what helped prevent the threat from ever being used. That whole world existed from 1945 till 1989. And between, uh, between 1989 and 1991, that world collapsed. The bipolar world collapsed. And we entered into a period from roughly 1990 till about 2010 in which the United States was the dominant power. There was no competition essentially. And it established a what's called a, an order of world politics, sometimes called the liberal order. But there were no direct major competitors to the United States. But from, 19, from 2010 on, the world has changed again in a direction that takes us back into a certain version of great power politics with the shadow of the nuclear age still hanging over. And that is because from 19, 2010 roughly on, but really from 1990 on growing slowly, two major contenders to the United States have arisen. Russia has been in decline in many ways, economically and socially, but it still has nuclear weapons, and it has a leader that has a view of the past and a view of the future, and that guides Russian policy, and we'll talk about that in terms of Ukraine also. Because the view of the past is that Mr. Putin has a very strong sense of Russia's history as an imperial power, an imperial empire. And he believes that he should lead Russia back to a status that is similar to that. That Russia would be recognized as a great power again in very different circumstances. So there's a memory of the past and a vision of the future and then there's a policy. Even more powerfully from 1990 on, there is the growing power of the People's Republic of China under the leadership of Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping also has a memory of the past 
and a vision of the future. The memory of the past, not simply his, but shared by others in China, is what they call the Hundred Years of Humiliation. From 1849 till 1949. And during that time, the Chinese state and people believed they were taken advantage of by other major powers in the world, that there were a series of unequal treaties that they were induced or coerced to sign, and that that, in a sense, kept Chinese capabilities uh, far below what they should be. And so Xi Jinping believes strongly that to overcome the humiliation of the past, it is necessary to pursue the China dream. China is now the second largest economy in the world on its way likely to becoming the first largest economy in the world. It does not have the same kind of nuclear capacity the Russians have, but it has enough and it will grow. So now we come to great power politics that neither is the five powers of the 19th century and early 20th century, nor is it the bipolar face-off of the Cold War. We now have a triangular power at the top. And that makes everything much more, com it is much more complicated to deal with deterrence with three major powers than two. But beyond that, the consequences of rising competition of these three major powers, complicated by what part of the legacy of the Ukrainian war is going to be, is that other powers are rethinking where they are and where they should be. In a major shift, the Japanese are rethinking their whole abstention from the use of force that came out of World War II. They have a military force, but for very limited purposes. There is now a rethinking of this. And that's a very serious question for the Japanese and for everyone else. I've had Japanese students at Harvard and ask them about this question. And in the past, they always said to open that question in Japan is to split the society wide open. It doesn't seem that way now that that is being rethought. South Korea is rethinking its posture in Asia, boarded by a nuclear power. Look around the world, China is playing a major diplomatic role that just produced a different set of relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I am not saying this is all wrong. This is descriptive of what's happening. It's a question of how we manage it. Wall Street Journal in the past weekend had a cover story in their review section that France and Germany are getting ready for war again. Probably an older statement. But my only point in walking you through this is that I think Ukraine is both a product of some of this and at the same time the consequences of Ukraine have set the world more on edge about whether possessing nuclear weapons is a terrible thing or maybe a necessary thing for a state. That's one kind of thing that people raise. And secondly, how do you manage this more complicated world? So that's my first stop back. That's the background to Ukraine. Now I want to turn to Ukraine itself. And then the third thing I want to do is to look at Pope Francis uh, and war and peace and Ukraine. So a bit of background on Ukraine. Um, it borders Russia, one of the largest land masses in Europe. At one time, it had been part of 
the Russian Empire. In the 1920s, after, after war, the end of World War I, uh, Ukraine had a certain independence. Russia was putting together the Soviet Union, and Ukraine was stepped in or, or, uh, or, or moved in to the Union of Socialist Republics. So then they fitted under Russian sovereignty as a distinct republic in the 1920s. During the 1930s, they suffered one of the most serious uh, catastrophes in world politics, and that was Stalin's agricultural policy, because as you know, the Ukraine is, a, is the breadbasket of the world in many ways. And for how to maximize that, that was a disaster. It led to the Ukrainian famine in which 4 million people died between 1932 and 1933. So they went from having a short spell of independence to fitting within the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics to suffering this terrible famine. And then you come to the end of World War II and they are back still part of the Soviet Union and remained in that setting uh, throughout the Cold War from 1945 to 1991. In 1992, they once again became independent. They faced a, the country has faced a series of internal problems to be sure uh, and uh, were often criticized for their internal politics. There were two movements of protest within the country that were noticeable. One was called the Orange Revolution in the year 2000. It was protesting about domestic affairs in the Ukraine. And then the Maiden Revo uh, uh, protest in 2014. So you, you had a country with lots of problems with corruption, lots of problems uh, with, with governance, uh, a pu public that showed itself somewhat restive, but remember the Soviet Union was a shadow in the background. The Soviets saw the Orange Revolution as a potential threat to themselves if it was contagious in terms of their own people. So then you come to the Putin era. <clears throat> President Putin was elected in 2000, served two terms as president, stepped down, served as prime minister, and then came back for this third term. Once again, his inheritance was uh, a Russia that was in decline. One commentator recently has said as a matter of example that the Russian economy is about the size and scope of the Italian <coughs> because of the decline in the Soviet Union. But their nuclear capacity hasn't declined at all. And as I've mentioned, there are Mr. Putin's memories and visions. By all accounts, the decision to invade Ukraine was driven by the president. And it is part of his overarching sense of restoring Russia to its rightful place in world politics. So that Russians themselves and the world will remember and recognize Russia again as a great power. They have enormous resources in energy as well as their nuclear status. They've obviously changed to a, some, a form of a market economy under an authoritarian government. While implementing Mr. Putin's vision is a multi-dimensional task, Putin's real concern is to exercise sovereignty over lands that he felt has been taken away from Russia since the collapse of communism. 
So from the beginning, when the Soviet Union collapsed entirely, uh, the Russians tried to set up a Russian federation of states where they wouldn't have the kind of direct control they had during the Cold War. But some overarching framework, they used to call it the near abroad. The near, meaning neighbors, abroad, no longer under the Soviet Union, but living next to them. And the Ukraine is very central in this. So much so that in July of uh, 2022, after the war started in the Ukraine, Mr. Putin wrote a 5,000 word declaration on how Russia and Ukraine are one people. And he traces it back to the history uh, of Russia and a time in which it was seen that Russia and Ukraine and Belarus all shared the sort of grounding in Christianity as one of the formative influences among them. So you come to his decision about Ukraine. It's the prime example of what Putin believes needs to be changed. The renegotiation of Ukraine into Russia because he's convinced they are the same people and that land, this territory has been taken away from Russia. What concerns him is on the one hand the historic reasons that he feels is what needs to be restored, but what also concerned him was what you might call the westward, the west Ward tilt, the tilt toward the West of Ukrainian politics. And while that was particularly a concern for the Ukrainians to try to become associated with the European Union, what Mr. Putin feels is that association with the uh, European Union will just be the first step to be followed by inclusion in NATO because he has found the expansion of NATO taking into NATO previously uh, uh, pre previous states that were under Russian control during the Cold War. He, he sees that as a direct threat uh, to Russia's interests. Now, the decision to take new states into NATO was a controversial decision here in the United States. One of the people who protested it strongly was George Kennan. George Kennan was perhaps the premier diplomatic historian uh, during the Cold War years a man who studied the Soviet Union, who knew it inside out, who developed the doctrine that was called containment, that in certain forms guided U.S. policy almost throughout the entire Cold War. That the idea was it was necessary to contain the Soviet Union at four or five key places in the world, but not to go to war with them but to keep it contained. And there would be debates all the time about what Kennan meant by containment. People who advocated the Vietnam War argued they were arguing in the legacy of containment until the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with fully televised hearings guided by Senator Fulbright invited George Kennan to testify before them in the middle of the Vietnam War. And everybody said every television was on in Washington when George Kennan went on to say, this is not my containment. But Kennan opposed expanding NATO, arguing in part, I think, that this is how the Russians would see it as a direct threat to their security. 
So you have a historic reason, a sort of tilt to the West and the expansion of NATO. Putin's policy arising out of his vision, at least as I understand it, his first move was to take this peninsula attached to Ukraine, to the southern part of Ukraine. And in 2014, he carried out a sort of stealth policy that it overnight turned Crimea back into Russian hands. The reaction of the West to it was to take it seriously, to respond to it by sanctions, but no one really considered the use of force once the move was made on containment. It wasn't considered as an option. So what we're dealing with today, the invasion of, of, of Ukraine itself, is the second step beyond the taking of Crimea. And that step was taken incrementally. Uh, Mr. Putin put 190,000 Russian troops on the border of Ukraine first. Now, a sovereign state can do that, but other sovereign states are going to worry about it. Uh, and then, very quickly, there was the invasion on February 24th of 2022. The background leading to the invasion, at least this is how people I trust uh, and know more about this presented, is that it was appeared to, it appears it had been planned by a small circle of Putin's advisors. Now, if you remember during the COVID, uh, President Putin really distanced himself from Russian society. He, he had this special Dhaka and he stayed there and ran the country from there. But apparently it was a small group of his advisors that decided this. A review of a book that I just read said the military did not know until a few days before the invasion what they were going to be tasked with. And so the goal appeared that Putin thought a quick strike across Ukraine could get to Kiev, unseat the government, and instore Russian power in Ukraine and Ukraine under Russian sovereignty. He didn't take into consideration three factors. The first factor is the Zelensky factor. That is to say the president of Ukraine. Now there's been a huge debate in social science and political science in the 20th century about what really moves major events in the world. Is it great personalities or is it in fact deep, powerful, material forces, economic forces, ideological forces, that that's what really counts, not individuals. And it is the second argument that has been the dominant argument. But Zelensky is a counterpoint to the argument that individuals don't count. And that was the first thing that the Soviet, that the Russians hadn't sufficiently considered. But what's also the key is that the second thing is the Ukrainian people. If Zelensky was by himself, that would not make much difference. But that's the second dimension. The Ukrainian people as citizens have demonstrated they are willing to put up with an enormous amount of suffering to maintain their independence. And then a subset of the Ukrainian people, the second reason is the Ukrainian military who have performed with extraordinary bravery and skill. The third factor is the degree of assistance from the West. 
Uh, ever since the Cold War has been over, there have been ongoing discussions about whether NATO had any future or not, or whether NATO had any purpose or not, or what NATO's purpose was. Now, the first uh, shift on that that sort of brought it to light was 9-11, because after 9-11, NATO committed to uh, to uh, provide troops uh, to Afghanistan, not a European theater framework. But the, uh, the, the invigoration of NATO in response to the Russian move has been remarkable. There is no longer debates about whether NATO has any purpose or capability. So those were the three factors, I think, that many feel the Russians misestimate. They underestimated the president, they underestimated the Ukrainian people, and they underestimated how far the West would go in, in uh, providing assistance. Now, a sub-theme that you have to keep in mind about this that is interesting about world politics I said we went through two world wars and a cold war, and we tended to think of those, and maybe it was because we were one of the major sources, tended to think of these as global events. And they were in many ways. But the interesting thing now is that you have countries that had previously been colonies of European powers, are now independent states in Latin America, Asia, Africa. And in those settings, this conflict is not seen very often as part of their business. They think about it as a European issue and not something that directly affects them. That's a very different atmosphere than prevailed, certainly in World War II, versus World War, and a bit in World War I. But that's an interesting factor in itself. So that, I think, is at least indications of how, the, how, how this uh, invasion took place. The outlook now, you can get, put five experts in a room, you get eight opinions. <laughs> The, the outlook now, in the mind of many, is a long, drawn-out, conventional conflict. Uh, General Milley, the chief of staff of the United States military, at one point in the debate said, let us all remember World War I. In the trenches, hundreds of miles, of, hundreds of yards apart, and just staying there for four years making progress yard by yard. And he said, you know, that kind of war could be what this kind of war is about. It's an enormously brutal reality. On the other hand, no one wants to see it go non-conventional. And part of what President Putin has done is at certain key moments, including within the last week, he has giving you a sense that in his mind the nuclear question gets woven into the conventional question. So this week he said he thinks he can uh, he can deploy nuclear weapons in Belarus, which is independent but closely allied to the Soviet. And in the past he has hinted that if his in, the interests of his people were threatened, there were no limits to which he would go. Now, again, the crystal ball effect is, a, I think, in that sense, a very healthy thing. It's one thing to make statements that are dramatic and irresponsible. It's another thing for someone to look in the eye and say, what happens if we start down that road? Because we have never been down that road. We have never been in a situation where more than one power had nuclear weapons and used them. 
And so all of a sudden, studies on the Cuban Missile Crisis are much in vogue again. Because as President Biden said, and others have affirmed, the Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest we ever came to use. So the outlook along Toronto War, that would be another question. And it is very different than the Cold War. One of the ways deterrence worked in the Cold War was not just that you had missiles, but that you had American forces on the front lines of the division of Germany. So if there was an invasion from the east, enough Americans would get killed that we were in the war. That was a purposeful design. Notice that in deciding how to help Ukraine, the red line has been there'll be no American forces. Because that's the escalatory factor. So a long drawn out conventional conflict, will the West continue to support and will it keep its sense of limits? And so this gets you into all kinds of which, what kind of weapons Mr. Zelensky feels he needs and what kind of weapons the West is willing to give. Because once you give weapons that could threaten the very heart of the Soviet Union, once again, things just get very, very dangerous. So, final comments on the Ukraine part. From politics and strategy to war, morality, and law. The fact is, this is the largest armed conflict on European territory since 1945. That's the fact. The evaluation of how it happened, I think it is a fair evaluation to say that this was an act of aggression. Aggression is crossing an internationally recognized boundary of a sovereign state. It is usually understood to be the easiest case to decide the morality of an action. And so the evaluation that this is an aggression puts you into the framework of the language of the morality of war as well as the politics and strategy of war. The morality of war has been argued since the time of Thucydides. And essentially three positions develop. One position says that all use of lethal force is always wrong. That is the classical systematic pacifist position. All uses of lethal force are always wrong. And there is a logic to that. There is a philosophy behind it. There's a theology behind it. It has always been a minority position. Not in a personal sense. Someone might be a pacifist and or, and, and in the United States after a couple of bad Supreme Court decisions, that right has been honored uh, for decades now. So that's the position. The second position, the counter position to that, is what you might call the classical realist position. The classical realist position is what we find in the history of the Peloponnesian War. The classical realist position essentially says war is beyond moral judgment. In other words, moral judgment is good for most things in life. But when you're talking about war and states and their behavior, it is beyond moral reach. So the classical uh, position 
developed out of Thucydides in the Malayan dialogue is that war cannot be constrained by morality. You just don't listen to that kind of language. The third position is the position that is called the just war position. It differs from the other two, although it shares something with each of them. The just war position says some uses of force are morally acceptable, but not all uses of force are morally acceptable. And then it develops a structure of moral argument for how you're going to answer what is morally acceptable and what is not. It shares with the pacifist position a presumption against the use of force, which needs to be overridden by moral argument, that this case means we should use force. It shares with the realist position the conviction expressed by St. Augustine at the heart of the just war position, where Augustine said, war is the result of sin, and war is the remedy for a sinful world. And so Augustine's argument was, look at human nature, and you will see that you may need to use coercion at, in, in fact. But, that doesn't mean you can just use it any way, any time, for any reason. So those are the three positions that are used generally uh, to make moral judgments on war. The Catholic Church has been identified historically with the middle position. I will tell you uh, as I move on into this lecture that there are challenges to that position today from within the church. But that's been the historical position. The second thing is that the just war doctrine is not simply Catholic. We don't own that the way we own the doctrine on the assumption of the Blessed Virgin. Other people use the just war doctrine and use it by their own standards. Uh, and it, if the Catholic Church disowned it tomorrow, it would continue because it has taken hold in uh, the world. So let's look quickly at uh, Ukraine. The way the just war position works is you start with a presumption against the use of force. If you're going to use it, you've got to override the presumption. You override the presumption by asking three questions. When can force why can force be used, when can force be used, and how can it be used? So the first question is, is what's called the just cause question. Why can force ever be used? It's the pacifist question. Why would you ever do this as a human being? And the answer generally has been that you shouldn't do it very often, but you can do it this way. You can use force to protect life, unjust attacks on life. Secondly, you can use force when activities of others threaten not simply life, but basic values in a society that make life, uh, make life livable with dignity. So if you get cases like that, you can override and say there is a just cause. Ukraine, I think, fits the just cause case. An invasion across a recognized international boundary is to be protected in world politics. somebody immediately is going to raise the case that the United States has already violated that. And that was the case of Kosovo. If you remember Kosovo, it was embedded in the Serbian state, but the Kosovars were not Serbian. And after the Balkan Wars, uh, the Kosovars said, we can't live under the Serbs. And essentially, they revolted or tried to, and gained, and they were put upon badly by the Serbs. 
the United States, with NATO, used force to draw a protective circle around the Kosovars within the Serbian state. It's like somebody drew a protective circle around Nebraska and said, Nebraska is in different condition than the other 50 states. So, just cause, I think it passed. The authority, the authority to make war rests in the first instance today with the UN Charter. The UN Charter says in Article 2, Paragraph 4, that force should not be used to, do, to resolve political issues. That's basically the pacifist position. In Article 51, it says states have the right to use force to defend their territorial integrity and the like. So it's this tension within the Charter. And beyond the Charter, there is the ancient doctrine that politic, legitimate political authority has the right to decide when to use force. Third question that comes up in, in, in Ukraine, and this would take much longer if we were to be thorough about it. The third question is proportionality. That is to say, I know something's been done that's been wrong. I know there's a threat. Is the threat of such a nature that it justifies my engagement in large-scale, conscious, purposeful taking of life? What's the proportion there? Proportion also is going to be a judgment, I think, in terms of how the Ukrainians finally decide their negotiating position. This is just me. But at some point, the question is going to arise about whether President Zelensky's constant refrain, we want every inch of Ukrainian territory back. Crimea and every other inch. Is that a disproportionate demand? Now, if you ask Ukrainians today who have their sons, husbands, daughters, kids dying, they'll have an answer. Is it an answer that the Russians will even entertain? So proportionality. The next question is, you have to ask, before you go to war, is there a moral possibility of success? Not a guarantee of success, but a moral possibility, meaning that you are going to involve killing human beings, destroying property, destroying the peace. Have you got a connection of ends and means that doing this produces some good outcome. And then the final kind of question, and I've skipped over some because we've got to keep moving. <laughs> the final <laughs> question is not whether you can use force, but how force is to be used. And this in modern warfare tends to be the one most concentrated on. Because that question is decided by two sub-questions. One, or two sub-propositions. One, the direct, intentional, purposeful killing of the innocent is always wrong and never permitted. Now, all those adjectives work. The direct, purposeful, intentional killing. I'm going to bomb the orphanage to break the hearts of people's will to fight. That's always wrong. So then someone says, well, let me give you an example from World War II. So you're a flight commander, and your briefing officer comes in and says, sir, the Germans have a huge tank factory outside Hamburg. They are turning out tanks left and right, killing our people. 
We've got them in our sights. It's a tank factory. Is that a legitimate target? Sounds like it in the middle of war. And so you say, okay. And he says, well, sir, I need to tell you, around that tank factory is an orphanage, a school, and a convent of nuns. And we'll do our best to only hit the tank factory. But I can't guarantee it. Now, hitting a legitimate target, but not intending to hit the school, is what the action is. If that's what it is, it is permissible up to the point where proportionality comes back in and says that's killing too many people, even though the target's legitimate. Now, the Russians have seemed to be targeting purposefully civilian centers, although they'll say they've been targeting infrastructure. And infrastructure gets targeted in war. It happened in London, it happened in Rotterdam, it happened in Bonn, and it happened in Tokyo, but it also went way beyond what was legitimate in several of those cases. So, the Russians can be criticized on their bombing strategy, but we need to also watch out how our allies are doing on their bombing strategy. And the press are key in this because they're remarkable in going after what happened. So, I have one more set of, of themes, and that is to look at Pope Francis. And this will be incomplete, I will tell you right away. It will be incomplete. Because Pope Francis talks in many different settings about this. The Vatican usually are pretty formal when they put something. But Pope Francis, particularly in his press conferences, coming back from overseas, gets questions and answers. And when you try and put them all together, it's not altogether clear uh, where the outcome of this comes down. And so I want to say that up front. But notice that I gave the title about war, morality, and religion. And religion and war is a bad mixture. Wars are difficult enough as human rational experience. But when you bring in religious conviction, on the one hand, it should help us to have a moral imagination. On the other hand, sometimes if you think God is just with you, there aren't many restraints that go on. So the religious factor here is not so much those questions, but the religious background. So. In order to answer the question in 2023, you have to go back to 1054. That's the 11th century. So, because the 11th century is when Christianity divided between Eastern and Western Christianity. Western being Roman, Eastern being Orthodox. Pope Francis met the Patriarch Kirill in 2015 in Havana of all places. The Pope was there on his visit to Cuba and in the mind of the State Department, I don't think they're necessarily right, the Cubans probably arranged for Pope Patriarch Carroll to come so they could have a meeting. It was the first time a Pope had met someone from the Russian Orthodox Church in a thousand years the first time they'd ever met as two human beings. Um, I had a student uh, who was in the in, uh, State Department at that time, and the State Department really felt they were setting the Pope up to have this meeting. But I am sure if the Pope, someone said to the Pope, the first meeting in a thousand years, he would say, too bad for the State Department. <laughs> I'm going to do this. So that was the first meeting. So you have Eastern and Western Christianity. So in the Ukraine, there is the, the uh, 
Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Orthodox Church, as you know, has no pope. They have patriarchs who govern various jurisdictions. No one patriarch has a, a control over the others on the whole. But the first among equals is the patriarch in Constantinople, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew. Before, long before the invasion, uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox appealed to the Patriarch in Constantinople that they be released from oversight by the Moscow Patriarch. The Moscow Patriarch had extended jurisdiction into Ukraine. And uh, Pope Bartholomew, uh, no, no, Pope Patriarch Bartholomew, granted their request. The Moscow Patriarch saw that as an insult. An insult, it saw it as uh, Western politics influencing the Orthodox Church and have not been happy about it. Now, for a number of papacies, this one, uh, John Paul II, Benedict, there's been an ongoing attempt to close the gap between Catholicism and Orthodoxy. We are very close. It is not like trying to close the gap between Lutherans, Methodists, Unitarians, and Catholics. We don't share sacraments. We don't share lines of authority, apostolic succession. We do with the Orthodox. An Orthodox person here in Wellesley who doesn't have a church or a parish can come here to receive communion. So we've got a lot of foundations. The split in 1054 was over the authority of the papacy, but as always more complicated. So there's been an attempt to find common ground and everybody's working. Obviously being at war is making this harder. But it's there as a background, and it has influenced, I think, uh, Pope Francis in terms of how he's tried to think about the war with the Ukraine. So Pope Francis's papacy has been marked by many different areas of involvement. When he first became Pope, uh, I was asked to give a number of talks in different places. And part of the talk is just the job description. I think any pope needs to be at least three things. He needs to be a pastor who can inspire people's faith. He needs to be an administrator. He's running an operation with 1.5 billion people in it. And he needs to be a diplomat, the only religious community in the world that has a diplomatic core. So he needs to be all of those three. I thought Francis would be a genius as a pastor, and I think that's been true. I didn't know how interested he was in administration, but he was interested in bringing people in who knew about administration. So he brought in people like McKinsey and others, said, take a look at this place, see how it runs. But I didn't expect him to be deeply involved in diplomacy. I just didn't think he would. I was wrong. He has his own personal style of diplomacy. It depends very much on personal interaction. He talks about a culture of encounter, and then he carries that over into diplomacy. So he's actually been quite active diplomatically. He's been active, I think, mainly on three what are called transnational issues. Transnational issues are issues that of their nature cut across national boundaries. Climate's transnational, in, uh, the environment's transnational, climate, same thing. Uh, immigration is transnational. You have to work together to solve it. He's been particularly interested in those. But war and peace tends to be interstate activity, and I act, this is just my judgment, I think he's been less active <coughs> at that level. So this has been a huge challenge. So, on the question of war and peace, uh, the Catholic history, again, 
starts in the fifth century. So uh, it starts even before the fifth century. It starts with the New Testament. So you have Jesus talking about turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, ask for your coat, give them your coat. This is not what you learn at diplomatic school. <laughs> this is not the job description. So how do you put that together? Well, partly Catholicism put it together by saying it's one thing to deal interpersonally. It's another thing to deal institutionally with states and structures and laws and policy. You still have to hold on to the inspiration of the, of the words, but you have to put them together. So Catholicism from the fifth century up through Pius XII, without qualification, only accepted the just war doctrine. As a matter of fact, Pius XII in the 1950s, when there was a debate about whether you could, uh, whether you could locate nuclear weapons on German soil, and there was a debate that challenged the state, Pius XII said no Catholic could be a conscientious objector when the state has laid out a policy. That changed. That changed. Um, and it changed with the Second Vatican Council. The Council stayed with the just war teaching. It said in a world where there's no central political authority, states have the right to defend themselves. It also said nuclear weapons are a challenge to our moral teaching, unlike anything in 2000 years. Unlike anything. When they got to deterrence, they didn't say right or wrong. They said, some think it helps. They didn't say they thought it helped, but they didn't condemn it. So coming out of the council, you've got these two strands. The strand that is nonviolent and pacifist has grown uh, among theologians. Uh, the just war has remained stable and, in fact, has spread. For a long time, it was regarded as Catholic, period. No one else used it. Today, almost anybody I could think of at Kennedy School would use it in a minute. So you have these two strands, and into it steps Francis. So Francis has been dealing with three questions, and I cannot sort out those three for you at the tail end of a lecture that's already exhausted. <laughs> because I'm not sure on some of this myself. So I just, uh, I, so let me use three steps. What Francis says about the theory of the moral theory of war and peace, what he says about nuclear weapons, and what he has said about Ukraine. He inherited both the just war and what the council said about nonviolence. In the past, the Vatican has said nonviolence is personal. But when you're talking about states, states have the right and duty to defend themselves. Francis is not totally supportive of that. Francis has said uh, there is no such thing as just war because people suffer. He then gets pressed. And he got pressed on Ukraine. Are you saying that the Ukrainians can't defend themselves? And he struggled on this. But uh, what we have is that it, it, he then at another time said, this is an abuse of power by the invading power. Now, the Vatican never names anybody in a diplomatic dispute. They never named anybody. Pius XII came under great criticism for not naming the Germans. But he said, so Francis has said things like, there is no such thing as just war because of the way people suffer. When he's pressed, he said to Volensky, uh, to, to the president of Ukraine, he said, you, you have to defend yourself. Well, if he says that, by what moral theory is he saying it? 
So he's been critical of just war, but I think if you take that out of the picture, you lose a resource that you need in these kind of complicated situations. So here's some of the things he said in his encyclical Fratelli Tutte, the most recent encyclical. He said, it is very difficult nowadays to invoke the rational criteria elaborated in earlier centuries to speak of the possibility of a just war. And then he says, never again war. Well, it is very difficult. That's right. It is very difficult. The question is, is it difficult, but it's still necessary? When he tried for a second encounter with Patriarch Kirill, it was by phone. They had a phone conversation that didn't go well. Patriarch Carol starts out the conversation, he takes out a piece of paper and he reads all the Russian arguments about why they're doing the right thing. And Francis said, I do not understand any of this. And then he said, there was a time, even in our churches, when people spoke of a holy war or a just war. Today we cannot speak in this manner. A Christian awareness of the importance of peace has developed. Wars are always unjust since it is the people of God who pay. War is never the way. It's a very strong statement. Very strong. Collapsing holy war with just war, I think, is just plain wrong. Holy war just can't be justified. Just war is a different. And then... In, on Ukraine, he said, there's no such thing as a just war. They do not exist. But he said to Zelensky, you can defend yourself. And then finally, I think probably the text I would use best. He says, in July 2022, six months into Ukraine, he says, I believe it is time to rethink the concept of a just war. A war may be just. There is a right to defend oneself. But we need to rethink the way that concept is used nowadays. I'm all for that. This doctrine is very complicated. The world is much more complicated than earlier centuries. I think hold on to the doctrine, but rethink it is the way to go. So that is a very long night, and we haven't even scratched the surface. And if you meet till Tim Colton at the at the Roach Brothers or anything, tell them you only heard a very little bit of what you know. So uh, I'll be glad to take questions because we said we'd go to nine, but if you want to leave, please leave. <laughs> Perfect. If you have a question, we'll start with Mitch. If you have a question, I'll just ask you, due to the acoustics in the space, if you could keep the microphone very close, speak loudly and slowly. Probably about six months ago, we heard uh, reports in the news that Mr. Putin was gravely ill, possibly with cancer, and it was possibly affecting his mind, et cetera, et cetera. And then that sort of disappeared from the press. Is there any um, justification for those kinds of comments? Have you I wouldn't know, but I don't think I'd tell you if I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, uh, I have no access to that kind of data. The CIA have people that are looking at every leader in the world that way, but I have no idea. First off, thank you for the decision overload. I've taken three pages of notes. <laughs> you haven't even started. I know, I know, I know. But you have a unique way of playing it out in, a, in, total, in an understandable fashion. Um, can you see the church convening, the Catholic Church, convening some sort of major synod or conference or something like that to get to try to draw up a, a for, more formal position on war yeah 
they they had the Vatican had a conference that well, I would say was mainly trying to look at the church's own teaching. They had a conference in Rome. I had been invited and I couldn't go, so I wasn't there for it. Uh, the outcome was that the people who were pressing to do away with just war, they were the ones that came out of the conference that talked the most, but then the Vatican rolled it back. So that was, uh, I, uh, right now, they're tied up with a synod that probably is going to exhaust Francis's lifetime. So then you're talking, I mean, I don't mean life or death, he might retire. I mean, he's supposed to go on now for th next two years to 2025. So they might, they might, because it's going to depend on the priorities. Of, because I didn't take you through all the popes. I mean, if you if you look at John Paul II, here's a man that lived under communism. Lived in, uh, he uh, he went on his first trip abroad. He went to North. He went to Ireland on his way here to Boston, and he knelt on the border of North and South Ireland and said, "War is." is is wrong it's irrational but i can then show you his comments after he i think visited uh, uh cemeteries in france after world war ii and he said when we think about these things we can't be romantic the world has evil in it you have to deal with it. so uh, i i don't know i think it's probably the next papacy but francis is leaving them a legacy they did deal with Yes, ma'am. I'm going to ask you to hold just so those at home can hear you as well. Here I come. I grew up in Germany at the time of the Cuba Missile Crisis, and the church offered about every week a prayer for peace, encouraged particularly young people and children to come to the church. Mm -hmm. And somehow I'm missing that in this crisis that people be more encouraged maybe to come in. No, not really. It's been, I mean, the Pope asked the church to pray all the time. Last, uh, last Saturday, uh, here in the Boston Archdiocese, we had a service at the Ukrainian parish in Jamaica Plain. Uh, Cardinal O'Malley uh, presided. Uh, uh, he invited and had the Ukrainian Metropolitan, uh, our Archbishop, Boris Gaidos. We were in graduate school together, so I've known him since the 1970s. He's a brilliant guy, brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, and uh, uh, he gave a talk. Uh, some of you probably, maybe all of you remember that within the last month or six weeks, we've taken up a collection at the diocesan level for Ukraine. We just got the numbers back. The Archdiocese gave $1.1 million to Ukraine. Uh, that is a larger collection than I can remember. And then we have our own gift to, from this parish. So there's actually been a lot of that, to be, to be honest. The, uh, uh, the, the Feast of the uh, Annunciation, which was last Saturday, uh, was a great time to celebrate together and about other instances. No, there's more of that. I did not stress any of that because my purpose was somewhat different. But I think you all look like prisoners. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's late and you need to go home. <laughs> well, I got one person that's. I got two. Okay, all right, here comes I'll Anna. give you a short <laughs> answer. Uh, do you think that if the Roman and the Orthodox Church couples together, but that could change the world order in any way. Well, it wouldn't hurt, that's for sure. <laughs> it just, I mean, it would be, it would be, as I say, we're talking about 1050. This has been a cause of split for a long, long time. I have one more, re and uh, so it would be a great thing religiously, it'd be a great thing, uh, I think, publicly too, because of the East-West divide. And because it, the Orthodox Church lives in the midst of Islam, they can, uh, and we have large numbers of Islamic people in our own country, so it could help us on different fronts. Yes. I just, it, there's, it's been bad behavior on both the East and the West, I mean, in terms of oh, yeah. worldly things. So 
I can't get into that, but there's another factor in terms of fairness in war or just just wars, and that would be when a much larger country attacks a small one. Mm -hmm. We have uh, my son and his family live in Taiwan, so the, you know the, the correspondence between Russia, Ukraine, and yeah. China and Taiwan is, is you know kind of legendary at this point. But what do you think in terms of justice? I mean, it seems unjust. For example, if uh, China attacked Ireland, <laughs> I mean, well, what, 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 what well, do you, how, how do but, you? Well, the, you, you know, you know, the best moral theologian the Catholic Church has produced in this country on these kinds of issues was a Jesuit, John Courtney Murray. And John Courtney Murray always said to people who were trying to solve moral problems. He said, be sure I'll do I'll do the original and then I'll translate. He said, be sure that the questio facti precedes the questio juris. What he meant by that is, before you make a moral judgment, make sure you understand how deep the problem is empirically before you make a moral judgment. The fact questio facti of the world is a world of 194 nations, no central authority, no one place can guarantee the security of everyone. So each actor has its own right to defend itself. It doesn't have its right, whether you're large or small, to go after somebody else. People do go after somebody else because Hobbes and Augustine told us what kind of people we are. <laughs> war is the result of sin, and war is the remedy for a sinful world. So I think it is, it, we, that's the, what we're dealing with. We're dealing with what uh, English philosopher called the crooked timber of humanity. The crooked timber of humanity means we're all imperfect. States are radically imperfect, and uh, therefore, trying to deal with this is more than large and small. That'll happen, large and large it will happen, and small and small. That's the question of Farke, and that's why the study of this question is tragic, but always interesting. So, good night. <laughs> Before you leave tonight, I just want to mention, um, this is a, you probably received an email in your email today. There are also QR codes on the posters in Powers Hall or on our website. Please give to our Lenten gift to City of Goodness in Ukraine. We very much appreciate your generosity. Thank you again, Father Aaron.